and they were there for just for such a substantial period of time. During that time, they made the discoveries which I'm talking about. Now, now I can't necessarily always document this, and I want to make it clear that there are some speculative elements in what I'm going to tell you. Um, <clears throat> but hopefully, you'll think that the speculation is overweighed, overweighed by the probability that what I'm saying is correct. Okay, so I like to think of this as being sort of scientific. And the fact is, what they learned in Europe is what convinced them that Jesus and Mary were black. <clears throat> okay, so something like this. In 1543, I mean, I'm sorry, in 1540, um, Alfonso sent his brother Manuel to go to Europe to study and to visit Rome and give Congo's official obedience to the church. They had tried to do this several times in the past and had been unable to get somebody to Rome to actually meet the Pope. Manuel's job was to do that. We have letters from him, but one of my accidental discoveries revealed that in fact, he had not made it to Rome, but he did make it to the northern northeast corner of Spain, where he was actually hosted by the King of Spain on two different occasions. Um, again, this was a random doc document search. Um, so he came back and it's my understanding, and this is based on what I've learned from uh, my research on pilgrimages in particular, is that he probably followed sort of the pilgrim's trail. And one of the people, a Portuguese person who took that voyage, the same trip to Rome, they would sort of stop at all the prominent religious sites along the way. And this particular person who traveled in 1543, two years after uh, Manuel made his uh, unsuccessful trip, he stopped at the sanctuary of Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, in Extremadura in Spain. A lot of people know Nossa Senora de uh, Guadalupe because of her role in the Americas, and that she has a role to play in Africa, as it turns out. Um, and this was a very important shrine um, to her, to the Virgin. And one of the features that this shrine had was that they had um, an image of the Virgin. Um, there's a whole miraculous story of this image of the Virgin. It was based on a painting allegedly done by the Apostle Luke from life. In other words, Luke met the Virgin and then did a painting of her. The, 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 a local chronicle written in 1513 that describes all this says that he was a great painter and a physician as well. And he painted her image. And then there's a series of miracles and losses and so on. I won't go into all of that except to say that she was finally recovered and placed in a, a, a place in the, in the altar. Um, now, what's interesting is that when Pedro Berreiro passed this area in 1543, he remarked that he noticed that there were lamps left in the Virgin's sanctuary by four kings. And one of those kings was the King of Congo. So this is one I discovered, I said, like in an internet search. And I said, what, what is this? Why is there a lamp for the King of Congo there? So I wrote promptly to the, um, to the church and I asked about this and they said, well, yes, we have archives and we have documents from our archives that show that there was a, um, a lamp left by King Diogo I in 1555, that's the Diogo of Congo. Um, and it was, uh, it weighed um, 227, no, I'm sorry. Yes, 227 marks, which is like 4.3 kilograms of silver. So you can imagine it's a pretty big thing. Um, and it was supported by a donation of 155 ducats. So now that's a strange thing because Diogo makes this donation in 1555, but in 1543, already Pedro Pereiros has seen it there. So uh, my guess is this, and this is a speculation. Manuel, passing through this place, saw the Virgin, was so moved by this that he decided to put some sort of a some sort of a, a offering there from whatever funds he had to establish this lamp. And then later, as time went on, Diogo more or less formally established it. In any case, the lamp is no longer in the church. I was kind of hoping it would be. It's been lost, but the archival references make it clear that it was there for quite some time. Okay, now what's interesting about the Virgin in Guadalupe? Well, you can see what it is. There she is and she's black. All right, so we know that in medieval Europe, there's a lot of black virgins. This is not an uncommon thing. Many people discuss it. Um, and there's been uh, all manner of literature as to why she's represented as black and what theological reasons may be behind that. But I'm gonna just argue that this was something that was impressive to um, Manuel and he carried that news back to Europe. 
enough impressive that Diogo was prepared to endow that particular church with a lamp. Um, not only that, but a few years after Diogo, 30 years after Diogo, um, Alvaro I, King of Congo, sent an ambassador to Rome, um, a Portuguese guy, Duarte Lop, um, to Rome, and he asked that um, Rome send him a copy of the painting of the Virgin by the Apostle Luke drawn from nature. Um, presumably imagining that this would be, you know, the original painting on which the sculpture was made. And he wanted it for his church. Um, I know that there are four virgins that are supposed to have been painted by Luke. And um, only one of them is black. And that's this one. The others were white. So I imagine that when the Carmelite missionaries brought um, an image of the virgin with them, uh, when, they, when they arrived in Congo in 1584, they probably brought one that was white. We don't know what came of that. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> just starting with here, we can say, obviously, Congolese had very good reason to believe that the Virgin was black. And they didn't just have to believe that because they learned this from a saint uh, or somebody who was possessed by, you know, by whoever. Um, they learned it because this is what they saw in Europe. And the Europeans, you know, bowed down to this image just like everybody else did. So it was clearly something that they paid attention to. This is an example of what kind of lamp might have been left there. I mean, this is not the one, as I said, but this is the kind of thing that you might have seen. <clears throat> okay. Here's the, um, the reference I got back from the archive. Uh, you can see the, the text of the, of the um, uh, message. It's in, in this house in the year 1555, a lamp of silver, which weighs 20 and seven marks, uh, I said 227, kind of a little jump there, okay? And for the the, so the foundation of it, 140, 55 uh, ducats. I can't actually see the whole screen, okay. Oh, and here's Alvaro the first, his instructions to Duarte Lopes, obtain a copy of the most vir holy virgin drawn from life uh, from the one that St. Luke made. Okay, so that step one was the, the virgin and Jesus. Step two is a little bit more complicated. Um, this has to do with the Garden of Eden. So medieval Europeans believed that the Garden of Eden didn't sort of just disappear when Adam and Eve left it, but that it was still remaining on Earth. Sometimes it was called the terrestrial paradise. Um, and generally speaking, they base themselves on, on the description of Eden in the book of Genesis, um, which says there are four rivers that flowed out from it. And many speculations that happened in medieval period over where those four rivers were and where they went. In the 15th century, um, generally speaking, those rivers were identified as ones that were pretty much flowing northward. But there was also this idea that there was, there was an equal number that flowed southward. And as soon as the Portuguese turned the corner, so to speak, and sailed down the coast of uh, Central Africa, which was in the 1480s, they ran into the Congo River. And this is a very impressive river. It turns the water fresh for many, many miles out to sea. Um, and we know this is a huge river system that dumps water into the Atlantic Ocean. And so not long afterwards, the river of Congo, they determined it was so huge and big, it must be one of the rivers that came out of the Arden of Eden. And here you see, this is a map from Maggiolo in 1513. There's an earlier one from 1506, which I, didn't, I couldn't get an image good enough to show, but you can see quite clearly. Here's the garden over here. Um, and over here is the, uh, the tree with the snake um, in it. And this is uh, some buildings and so on. These are the mountains of the moon, which often associated with the Garden of Eden. And so here we have now Europeans already in 1512 at the very, or 1513 at the very latest, having maps around which African visitors to, to Europe, especially those who stay there for a long time are gonna see and understand, okay, so the Garden of Eden is in Central Africa. The Congo River flows out of it. Um, other maps actually identified, identified the Sambesi River that goes the other direction as, as, the, thir as the third river, to come, or second river, to come out of, out of um, a garden in Central Africa. We know that when, um, when Carmelite missionaries came to Congo in 1583, they recorded this exact fact as it was understood in Congo, that the kingdom of Congo, the river of Congo comes out of the Garden of Eden, and that that's a very blessed place because of that. They also heard a local story that one of the kings of Congo tried to send a ship up the river to reach the Garden of Eden. 
but it failed to do so because they met monsters on the side of the road of the, of the um, river. Now, one of the medieval stories about uh, the Garden of Eden is that its current location is protected by various angels and demons and so on that, that prevent people from going there. So presumably this is, and the Carmelites actually report this as a, as a tradition that they heard from a noble Congo. So we're assuming that this idea had reached Congo probably well before 1580, um, and that it was now prominent in Congo understanding of their position. <clears throat> we also know that in chatting with Alvaro, this is the same Alvaro who sent to Rome to get this uh, image of the Virgin to bring back in 1583, three, <laughs> Sorry, I have a cold. I've tested negative this morning for all time's sake. Um, so I, I, people say not COVID, at least not yet. Okay. Um, Alvaro, so one of the Carmelite missionaries um, met with Alvaro and they were chatting about leaves and trees. And this is another document which I discovered quite by accident on the, uh, on the internet. Um, and he says that while discussing a particular tree called Safu, um, that um, the Safu leaves um, were, let me see, do I have this? This is what Safu looks like. <laughs> the Safu leaves were big enough to cover a person. And he, Alvaro told the priest that he said he thought this was the fig tree from which Adam and Eve covered their nakedness after the fall. Um, <clears throat> so, it seems to me to be a reasonable supposition to make two things joining here already. One of them is the presence based on European testimony, so to speak, of a black virgin and a black Jesus. And secondly, a central African location for the Garden of Eden, presumably to represent the black guard, um, Adam and Eve. Um, it's ironic in a way that, um, you know, the Europeans would have dismissed such a thing, but we know that the genetic Adam and Eve actually did exist in South Central Africa, that's an actual fact. And of course, we know that the original Adam and Eve, if we can imagine that that genetic version was also African in her appearance and their appearance. So it just so happens that they, they got it right this time. Okay, now there's more. Yes, of course. Um, there was always a little bit of a amazement on the part of visitors to Congo and people who knew the place as to how quickly it converted to Christianity and how little resistance there was to it, both at the beginning and all the way through. Um, and so there had to be some sort of understanding of that. And increasingly, I think the Congos became disappointed that they weren't sort of in this story from the beginning. So not surprisingly, um, when the Carmelite missionaries were working in Congo again, they, um, they heard that, in fact, the Apostle Thomas had visited Congo in ancient times. So the Apostle Thomas, oh, I don't want to get ahead of myself. The Apostle Thomas, Wait, wait, we got to, oh, that's Adam and Eve. Okay, I, I like this particular one. This was done by sort of an Afro-nationalist group to say, you know, false and true. This was based on the genetic evidence. Um, okay, so I'll get back to the, my slides right, slides out of order. What a surprise. Okay, um, this is a testimony from the Bishop of Congo um, in 1553, I mean, 1583. Um, and so he's wondering about um, how Congo became such a strong Christian country. And he says, you know, um, it was learned, he said he'd already heard this for certain, that an apostle had passed through there at the time of the evangelical preaching and found out that it was St. Thomas who left some letters written on a stone, which no one knows how to read. But there are phrases that are Hebrew, and this is by tradition, and the letters testify to being true. And this also confirms what happens in Brazil, a land that is also black, sort of a strange thing. Here's a, a, a famous painting of St. Thomas looking at Jesus's uh, wombs. That's Doubting Thomas, for those of you that know biblical stories. St. Thomas was, in fact, credited at this very time with visiting all manner of places all over the world. Many American countries, for example, uh, after the Spanish sort of landed there, uh, hooked on to this idea of St. Thomas visiting. But the earliest version of this, uh, reported by, German, by Portuguese sailors in Germany in 1513, was that St. Thomas had come to Brazil and that the footprints of St. Thomas could be found on rocks. Jesuit missionaries eventually located these and decided that they were important components of the sort of vision of what um, St. Thomas might have done. So the idea, again, widespread in Europe, that St. Thomas had gone all manner of different places. No surprise that somehow 
he also managed to find his way to Congo. I can't fill in all the blanks between this, but it's, uh, it's well enough to imagine that um, in the way in which oral tradition functions, that the St. Thomas story could become grafted on um, to the original story. Um, it, as it happens, that uh, Congolese reported these kinds of things. Okay, I want to go back now. So <clears throat> here's what we get out of, um, out of the Adam and Eve uh, version of the story. And that is, a, this is reported by Cavazzi in 1664, quite a long time after this, but undoubtedly there before him. And it says that they believe that God assigned his angels and his other ministers with the care of the rest of the world in order to place the chaos in order at the beginning of the world. He reserved for himself alone the formation, according to his inclination and spirit, of the lands of Africa, especially the kingdom of Congo. So again, this is widespread already in the 1660s, and probably, I would guess, by the time of Alvar I. Alvar I was a, a Congolese king who was very much um, interested in, in, um, in establishing Congo as a country that was equal to European countries. So he, for example, it was Alvar I that renamed the capital San Salvador from Banza Congo. Um, and it was he who spent a lot of time trying to get a bishop, uh, their own bishop for Congo. Um, he was successful in doing that, Although Portuguese, uh, unfortunately for him, Portuguese claimed the right of patronage, and so it was the Portuguese who became their bishop. Um, but again, we're having an assemblage of things. And I, I think that probably, although the, the roots of this go back as far at least as Alfonso, the real formation of it happens in the time of Alvaro. Um, Alvaro was a quite a learned man. Um, um, uh, the Carmelites uh, reported that he used to um, read uh, works of Lu Luis de Granada, a Spanish theologian, to his family at night. Um, and he was the one that they wanted to read it because nobody else could read it as well as he could. Uh, Luis de Granada is not sort of your lightweight theologian. It's not a catechismal work at all. It's a, it's a quite serious work of theology. Um, and so you can imagine that this is a sort of way in which the Congolese elite is functioning. Now, <clears throat> to return for a minute, we can imagine that there's now this story functioning in the kingdom um, that that maintains that the world was started in Africa, it was started in Congo, that Adam and Eve were Congolese, um, that the Virgin Mary and Jesus were also Congolese, um, and so this whole Christian world sort of fits out very well in their own in their own place and in their own time. Let's see, did I go back to this? Okay, well, this is this is places where Saint Thomas is supposed to have gone, right? India, especially, was probably if he, he went anywhere, he went to India, but they also have him going to Brazil, as you can see here. When we mentioned those from that rock engraving, these are the rock engravings in Lovu. Um, it's quite a famous rock formation in northern, northern, uh, the northern part of the old kingdom of Congo. It's actually in the lower Congo province in Zaire, or Zaire, DRC today. Um, and I suppose one could look at rock engravings like this and imagine that um, somehow there are letters in Hebrew. In any case, Lovo is reported to have been a very sacred ancient place uh, associated with the origins of the Kingdom of Congo. Um, Cavazzi, in his own account of, of this area, says that the place was so sacred that to, even to look at it was likely to cause you to die. Um, <clears throat> so the idea that St. Thomas had left his mark there, again, has a sort of physical resonance and something that Congolese already undoubtedly identified as a sacred spot fits into the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> finally, we might mention the question of, of black saints. Um, so what about the saints? Well, we know that at the Battle of Bumbi in 1622, at this point, the Portuguese have formed their colony in Angola. Um, and um, initially they were getting along well with Congo, but eventually the governors became a little bit greedy and wanted to take over Congo. So they actually physically invaded Congo in 1622. At the initial battle between the Portuguese invading force and the Congolese army, which was just a detachment of the army, according to Caternega, the sort of Portuguese chronicler of these wars, he said that at the beginning of the battle, before they started, um, the Congolese uh, uh, called out to St. Saint, to saint James, St. Saint James the Greater, or Santiago, uh, sort of the military saint of the Iberian Peninsula. And, uh, and the Portuguese did too. And when challenged on this, the, the Congolese reported that they said, your St. Saint, your Saint James might be white, but our St. James is black. Um, 
And so again, we have this same process of clearly identifying the whole sort of family as being part of Congolese and by extension also being black. So finally, we have the representation of Jesus in Congolese art. So this is a, an example of a Congolese crucifix. Um, the dating of these things has been difficult. Um, it's, it's very hard to know exactly when they were when they were created. Um, and many of them, of course, are, are found in shrines and places like that. So they've been maintained in a not in an archaeological context, but in an active use context. Um, and what's interesting about this one is, first of all, uh, Robert Van, Van, um, Vanin, who published this. Oh my gosh, what did I do to myself? Okay. Um, who published this piece, uh, wanted to make a point that Jesus was represented here as an African. If you look at, you see the hair feature here, um, and it's harder to see here, but his nose and so on. And what's interesting, especially, is that the lozenge pattern on the on the on the loincloths that these people wear. This is a characteristic Central African motif. You find it on textiles um, from Central Africa in particular. And so this is a good example of sort of understanding that that Jesus was black, and so he's represented in this way in this artwork. Uh, we and once we get chronology for these, and if we establish that when this happens, we might be able to do something with it. My sense is that these are a little bit later in time. In fact. Um, no, only quite recently, I suggested that this this particular art form developed after Donna Beatrice's preaching when she has sort of proclaimed this, because I was also prepared to believe that it wasn't really until Beatrice's time that the sort of nationalization of Congolese religion took place. But then I made all these discoveries in the course of the project I was doing with Leash, and there it is. Um, there's enough there, in my opinion, to say that, the, that this nationalization process um, took place quite a bit earlier and on a very different basis than simply revelations made by possessed mediums. Okay, so I think I'm coming to the end of what I'm going to say, about getting to the end of my slides anyway. So I don't know how long I was talking because I had no light, um, no thing to, uh, to guide me, but I'll be very happy to entertain questions from here forward. Well, Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, John. This was fascinating. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, as you said, we've been sort of going back and forth, um, talking about many of these issues. And um, it's, I, I love the way you described the sort of serendipitous aspect of the research, you know, that you were <laughs> just doing a Google search and you, and you, um, you know, came across all this, all this really, uh, interesting stuff. So um, I guess my job today is to be moderator and, and not questioner. So if um, anybody has questions, again, you have several ways to pose your questions. You can either pose them uh, live or you can uh, post them in the chat. We see there's one. There's one. Yeah. So yeah, Leah just um, talked about the, I mean, just mentioned the several different ways in which um okay i'll keep the chat yeah. up so i know <laughs> yeah and also i'll just add quickly we do have a number of guests in room 206 and in ingram who are in person oh. um, if any of you have a question elisha can assist you uh with raising the, your collective hand <laughs> and we can help you ask that question for those of you in room 206 okay well th there's a question that which has just been posted in the chat from uh Juretta. Uh, Heckscher, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, and uh, Juretta asks, is there any evidence, iconographic or otherwise, that Congo had contact with the ancient Christianity of Ethiopia and was influenced by it in any way as part of this process? Interesting question. Of course, right from the very beginning, when Portuguese began visiting uh, West Central Africa, they were fascinated by two things. One of them was the lake, the river, of course, but also they learned in the interior there was a large lake um, that was Lake Mindombe for people who know something about the geography. It's a, it's a, it's one of the various lakes that feeds the Congo River, but it's quite it's quite close to Congo. Um, and so they spent a good deal of time actually trying to imagine that they could make that trip from Congo to Ethiopia, um, especially because they, they were you know the Portuguese had difficulties in, in in the logistics of a long voyage to Ethiopia, and they were committed to actually you know military assistance in, in Ethiopia. And one of the things the Jesuits concluded after they actually sent somebody as far as as far as the lake, um, a man by the name of the Castro, I've forgotten what his first name was now, 
Um, and uh, he, he basically, he had to stop because he met people that could nobody could understand the language of the place. Uh, but basically what the Jesuits concluded was it's impossible. <laughs> even, even in the 17th century, this is a long, long way to go. Um, and there's no evidence that anybody did. I've often thought about the possibility of that sort of that fusion, but I, I can't see a route, at least at the present point, or any evidence of that. <clears throat> of that. Um, yeah, any, all right, thank you. Any, um, any other questions or comments for Professor Thornton? Um, I have, I have several. So until, <laughs> until you, you know, somebody thinks of a question, actually, wait, there's one, there's one. Um, so this is from Isaac Lee. Is there any evidence that the church or other European officials tried to control uh, or discredit images of Jesus being black? So uh, that's a that's a that's a good question. It's an interesting question. Um, as far as I know, there's no specific indication that any of the of the church uh, hierarchy or any of the European missionaries. Um, challenge this. They they often dismissed it, um, as Cavazzi did when he talked about this idea that God created the world and um, and spent all of his time in Congo. They thought that was sort of a foolish idea that they had. But as far as I can see, they didn't really press on that. What's interesting, though, is that Donna Beatrice did actually press this issue. Mm. And that's because when the Capuchin missionaries came in 1645, one of the things that the Capuchin missionaries really did in Congo was they, they brought the Counter-Reformation. Um, Congo was born, Congolese Christianity was born in the medieval period, um, before the reform movement. In fact, uh, Congo's first bishop, Enrique, was invited uh, to the Council of Trent to sort of start the Counter-Reformation, but he couldn't make it because he, he passed away. Um, and so this was a medieval church. And it's interesting that most of us, of course, we know how Catholic missionaries function in Africa. We don't realize they function exactly the same way in Europe. Uh, part of the Counter-Reformation was to say, basically, European Christianity was totally destroyed. We might as well be pagans. We're going to start all over again from scratch, which is what they did in Europe, in Italy and France and all of these countries. They sort of went with the assumption that everything that came before was 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 corrupt and it would have to be straightened out. So when they arrive in Congo, of course, it's the same story. Um, but what they brought with them, of course, was many images of the saints, many pictures and so on. They were always white. And Donna Beatrice even before she had her full revelations, contested this idea. She said, why are there no black saints? We know that there are black saints. Why aren't you showing us black saints? Um, and basically, I mean, I, I, the Capuchins didn't have an answer for that. Um, as far as they were concerned, there weren't any black saints or if there were, they were the ones that were traditionally known in the church, the St. Maurice and so on. <laughs> um, and so they didn't have much to say. Um, St. Benedict of Palermo, I think was also he was widely regarded in Angola as a as a black saint, but the Congolese idea was not just that. But Saint James and and you know really prominent saints were also um, black. Uh, Cadernega reports for us, for example, that the black magus and the Christmas and the nativity scene um, was from Kisama, which is a, a province of Angola. So even in Angola, this was sort of a Portuguese colony. This was sort of an idea that was bubbling up. The, the, the Angolan church in many ways owed a lot to the Congolese church. And so it's not surprising that we might've find that as a folk belief, but there in Angola, the Portuguese had more control. In Congo, they were, the, 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 the Capuchin missionaries were not in a position to do much. There were never more than about six or seven of them in the whole country. They had no secular power behind them. If the Kings didn't support them, they were sort of stuck. And they often complained that they didn't get as much cooperation as they would like from local political authorities. So I think in general, they probably didn't press very hard on these kinds of issues. They knew it wouldn't be popular. And so they, they didn't bother with it. What they did focus on was things that were specifically not Christian in origin, as they did in Europe. For example, in many places in Europe, there was sort of a local place that had, you know, uh, a spirit that protected it. that wasn't necessarily a Christian spirit. And they would go after those kinds of places. You see this a lot of times in, in the social history literature in Europe, how many times we had these non-Christian spiritual entities that were still being followed, supplicated and so on, even into the 18th and 19th centuries. And so um, that's what they went after. They went after those. They didn't try to go after the, 
the, the, the high level uh, ideas. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. There's um, another uh, question yeah. from. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. About, um, you can read it. Great. Yep. Yeah. Right. So, um, when I was first, when I first wrote my PhD dissertation, obviously Donna Beatrice was a part of it. And following my um, my PhD, my first job was at the University of Zambia. And I had worked in mental health um, uh, while I was a, a, a grad student. I had a part time job in the Veterans Administration in a health a mental health institution. So I was familiar with some sort of the sort of jargon of mental health. And when I got to Zambia, it was one of the questions I asked myself as well. You know, is it possible that she was insane? And that, or or that she had faked it, um, and so I went over to Chinama Hospital and and sort of chatted up people there, and I ran into a, a physician, a, a psychiatrist, um, who had studied in the U.S. Um, she had a, a did her residency at Johns Hopkins. She practiced in, in in prominent hospitals in New York before she came back to Zambia. So I had a nice discussion with her about possession. One of the things that she told me um, was that. In Africa, just about everything that we that we classify as a mental health disorder um, manifests itself in Africa. It presents itself, as they say in the medical field, um, as possession, um, and that is relatively easy to tell what possession is genuine. And she did say there was such a thing as genuine possession versus what was simply a mental health issue. And I, I, I mean, I, I saw it. I mean, anybody, I think, who lives in, at least in Central Africa, you see possessed people walking down the street. Um, and people know this one's crazy and this one's not. Um, and so I concluded, based on that, that I thought Beatrice was probably actually possessed um, and that it wasn't faked and that she wasn't insane. Interestingly enough, um, one of her associates, um, Mafuta, um, Apollonia Mafuta, when the um, when the authorities, this was the Congolese authorities, arrested them and eventually they burned Donna Beatrice at the stake. It wasn't the church made a point that the missionaries made a point. They didn't have anything to do with the execution of Donna Beatrice. Um, this was Pedro the Fourth, King of Congo's decision. He she represented a serious threat to his throne, and he and so he took action that way. He excused a podium uh, Apollonia Mafuta because she was insane. So I'm saying that that distinction was there and it was made that way. Oh, somebody wants to ask a question live. Go ahead. That's good. <laughs> I'm not making a presentation next week. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, there's another question from Paul Grant. I don't know if you can see it in the Q and A. If not, I can read it. Um, I'm I'm not seeing it in the chat. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's in the Q and A. I'll read it. It's uh, so building on your comment about the Counter Reformation. Can you speak more about self evangelization? What did what did it look like on the ground in the in Congo pre Trent? Did the Congo feel uh, they needed priests from Europe? Okay, wow, those are that's a that's a that's a good complicated question. So, <laughs> um, first of all, the Congolese needed priests because as Catholics they had to have the sacraments, and the only person who could perform the sacraments is an ordained priest. Um, and so, one of the issues that was right away came up was, okay, can Congo get a bishop to consecrate its own priests? Alfonso presented an ambitious plan, as Luis knows very well, to have 50 priests come with uh, two bishops and, and so on, which would have been an adequate su supply for the country's needs, but that was never met. That was never met. So generally speaking, what priests did in Congo was the sacraments, and they did them like crazy. Um, we know that that um, on average, according to a report of 1623, on average, about 40,000, 45,000 people a year were baptized. And that was done by like four priests. Um, so they spent all their time. The same was true with the Capuchins. Almost everything the Capuchins did, when you read their reports and their letters, they're baptizing, 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 baptizing. Um, and, and that's the sacrament that they had to do. And, and most of the time it was just touring to do that. Okay, so um, the, the actual work of evangelization was done by the Masters de Scola. Um, interestingly enough, in 1584, the Inquisition arrested um, a priest, and in the testimony about his arrest, which was not necessarily concerning evangelical work in Congo, he made the comment that they didn't do any teaching. He said, because they have people of their own nation, noble people, literate people, 
who do all the teaching. All we do is do the sacraments. Um, <clears throat> so, and this person, I believe he was a Dominican priest. And in any case, um, that's, that's basically what priests were there for, for doing. Had Congo gotten its own clergy and been able to, uh, you know, to educate them and to, and to ordain them, <clears throat> we might've seen a different story. Um, but that's what the, that's what the priests were there for. Um, and so, uh, they, you know, if they, if they had been able to have their own priests, it would have been, we, as I said, we would have had a different type of thing, but that's what we got these, uh, European clergy, that's what they were there to do. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, well, great. Thanks. I, um, Aliyah just sent a reminder to uh, the folks in 206. I don't know if anybody would like uh, to pose a question from that space. Um, and, and Paul, thanks, thanks you very much for the answer. So I think you did, <laughs> you, you had asked if you, uh, if you had answered the question. So I think that was, um, um, okay. Well, as I said, I mean, I have, I have a few, uh, a few questions. So until I'm, I'm looking carefully to see if uh, another question pops up, but so this one's a, a little bit, um, you know, as, as, as John's been saying, we've been kind of, two of us have been delving into the correspondence and, so a lot of these issues are quite uh, fresh, I guess. But one yeah. question I had was about uh, Santiago, St. James, the Black Santiago. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, thinking about that that really important letter, um, you know, in which, um, well, that actually comes up in several letters, but there's there's a one important letter in which uh, Afonso uh, narrates the miracle, right? That allowed him basically to assume power. So Santiago is there at the founding of, let's say a kind of Christian, uh, kingdom of Congo, right? And when Santiago appears, in fact, uh, you know the 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 um, scallop shells are included in the in the banner or the the it, flag, it, it, right? And it's so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you found this reference in Cardonega uh, to to the, the, the sort of you know evocation of black Santi of a black Santiago. If, have you ever, you know, have you, been, have you been able to trace any any other references to to a, a black Santiago, Saint James, or is that the first time? Yeah, no, that's the first time I've seen I've seen him specifically stated to be black. Um, I should point out that the documentary record of the 16th century is not as rich as it is for the 17th century. So uh, we could easily miss things. Um, we have the correspondence of Alfonso, which is quite extensive and quite informative. We have a pretty good correspondence from Diogo as well, um, although it's not mostly about religious matters in Diogo's case. And then after that, it's kind of very wishy-washy until the Carmelites come. And the yeah. Carmelites are the first ones that really tell us a lot of this kind of stuff. But even there, they don't mention uh, specifically Santiago, or for that matter, I think there's nothing in the in the in the uh, Carmelite record that indicates that they had any discussion whatsoever about the nature of the saints. Yeah, interesting. Thanks. Um, no, any other questions or comments? Well, I mean, I think you're right about. Uh, no, of course, I think you are absolutely right about the uh, the scarcity of of um, Portuguese priests. I mean, from the very beginning, I think it's one light motif, one recurring motif in Afonso's letters is asking for more priests, right? For priests. And demanding and and you know beseeching. I mean, it, the the tone gets that gets pretty insistent, and uh, and so I think. Um, I mean, it's the, the the argument you you lay out about a, a sort of self evangelization is quite compelling. In, in in fact, I mean, the other aspect that you you didn't mention but went, could talk about as well is uh, the not you know all these very edifying examples that Portuguese clergy, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's sort of taking up local women, fighting with each other again over women and things like that. I mean, not and it, what's striking is that in spite of all those. Uh, of all those, uh, as I said, not particularly Christian examples of Christian charity and so forth, that Christianity remained, Christianity remained, uh, you know, rooted and entrenched, and and uh, and it, in fact, uh, it, you know, developed uh, on in in its own, on its own, despite uh, <laughs> the evangelist best efforts, I guess we can say. So, yeah, yeah I mean, I think also that. Um... The, the school masters, we don't have a lot of literature on them. It's, it is not much to say about it, except that what we do have indicates that it's quite, they're quite prominent. Um, and these were, these were noble people. They were educated, they were literate. Um, and I think they were the ones that really sort of 
collectively or one way or another created this um, this image. Now I see we have a question from from Marissa. Let me draw. You can, okay, yeah, go ahead. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, the implicate. So the question was, can you draw out what you think the implications of this are for your our understanding of the Congo Kingdom for the interpretation of the role of Kimpa Vita and or for the contemporary Congo society? So I guess with regards to the contemporary Congo society, there's no question that BDK or Mundija Congo and many other sort of uh, um, spiritual movements have latched on to Donna Beatrice as their founding member and honor her and, and so on. So we have lots and lots of, of, of attention to that here. That I think is a reaction to the colonial church, um, which was, you know, as it was had the sort of racist and, and um, um, nationalist component that the Portuguese clergy carried to Angola. And then and a counteraction is that is to, is to develop a neo a neo um, traditional religion that relies on a sort of a break from the Christian church. That's how the modern people certainly see it. Um, as far as the for the development of the Congo Kingdom, I think it's significant, first of all, that it gave people, the ordinary people living in the Kingdom of Congo, a sense of connection to the church because they could believe that their people were involved in it. It wasn't a foreign religion as much as it, it might have appeared to be, um, especially for people who, who studied it from the outside. I mean, this is kind of the impression I think most of us studying Congo had when we, when we went into the study was that this was uh, sort of imposed in some way or another. Um, uh, but we know Congo didn't have any colonial relationship with, with Angola or with Portugal during this time. It was an independent country and they pretty much ran what they wanted to do. And if people didn't do what they liked, they could just throw them out. Um, so I think that's probably the way that goes. I think with regards to the interpretation, we're just at the beginning of this process. One of the things that I think is interesting is that right now I'm involved in the, uh, in, as, a, as a scholarly advisor, to the Netflix project that's going to create a um, a four part video series on on Netflix that will that will drop in February, um, and so Queen Jinga, um, I didn't realize this until we started really digging into the research. Lin Linda Haywood, my wife, wrote a, a book, and maybe people know this about Queen Jinga, a very detailed biography of her. One of the things that she discovered was that that the catechist who actually uh, Catechized Jinga for the first time in 1622 was a Congolese priest, a man named um, Kalisto Zelotich dos Reis Magrush. Um, and then he became her catechist, or he became the person who, when she was when she returned to the faith in 1656, he was there to do that. Um, and I think that that he probably carried when he was you know, a catechizing Jinga, he probably carried with him some of that idea of an African Jesus and an African church, and it might have made it much more receptive to her. She was no friend of the Portuguese, um, and she was not an enemy of traditional society, but then neither were the Congolese. They had already come to terms with all that, and they had developed a sort of an Africanized Christianity, which would make sense to people who are Africans. I think this is important in the diaspora, too. We know that there's evidence that Congolese slaves in the diaspora, people who were enslaved, not necessarily um, everybody, but people who were enslaved, um, among them were people who were masters to scholar, and some we have evidence of them actually doing evangelical work um, amongst fellow slaves in Brazil, and also in the Virgin Islands, and I suspect in many or many more places. And we'll and we'll be starting to try to see what role the specifically Christian Congolese component brings to the Christianity of African America in the larger sense. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm just nodding my head. You can't see me, but uh, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Um, well, we we're about. Um, I don't know if you read uh, Marissa's comment. <laughs> uh, we're about two minutes before time, but I think we can entertain another question if there is another question. If not, um, I will thank you on behalf of everyone in the center for. Um, a really, um, you know, incredible uh, and and fruitful and thought provoking lecture, um, and I hope we can finally meet in person at some point, John. <laughs> <laughs> we keep. I mean, we've been working together virtually for so time for for so much for so long. I think you know. Yeah, maybe Paul, Paul Grant is asking if this research is forthcoming in print. Oh, uh, yeah, yes. I'll eventually publish 
publish a piece on this. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm also signed up. I'm also signed up, by the way, with um, uh, Rick Todhunter to do Donna Beatrice's documentation. And so I'll make a yeah. chapter in that. But I, I want to publish this as a standalone piece eventually. I just have to get rid yeah. of the stuff on my plate right now before I can get to it. Yeah, um, John. Very quickly, you you uh, you must be very familiar with a with a historical novel by Enrica Branch about uh, Dona Beatriz. Yeah, the, right. The Congo. I don't know if you've read it and what you think. I about have. It. Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. it's it's an interesting piece. <laughs> it is. Yes, I, yeah. I think he actually was he actually believed what he wrote in that novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I I could see that. Um, well. Thank you. Thank you so much um, again. And thank you, uh, everyone, for coming and uh, attending. And uh, again, we have some comments in the chat. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it was great, John. Thanks. It was, it was great to hear from you and learn from you. Very, very happy. <laughs> OK. Oh, we had learned that um, Mena Branch has a play. Yes, that's true. He does. He does. Yep, I forgot about that. Yeah, I mean, I actually uh, have <laughs> um, am working on it a little bit. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marisa. Okay. Well, thank you to everybody who's thanking me. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again, John. And thanks every okay. thank you everyone for attending. Okay. I'll see you all next week. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.